Thank you for uh, having me. It's really a pleasure to be there. I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, behavioral decision research and uh, pandemic disease. Um, you all have uh, have Wendy, so uh, you know something about behavioral decision research. As, as many of you may know, USC is a longtime center of this kind of research, perhaps starting with Ward Edwards and uh, Detloff von Winterfeld, Richard John, and other people that you have there now. So uh, this will be familiar to many of you. So when we do our job right, we do three things in studying a decision. We do analysis, trying to determine the decisions that people face using the best available evidence. We do descriptive research, that is how do people deal with those decisions. And then we try interventions to help people to make better decisions. Uh, we rarely get it right the first time, so this is typically an iterative process. Uh, uh, my colleagues and I have pursued this basic paradigm in a wide variety of different decisions, quite a few of them involving, uh, involving Wendy. I'd like to talk about um, uh, some work that we've done over the recent years in pandemic disease. So my introduction to pandemic disease was this um, episode that some people will remember where we were concerned in the uh, run-up to the Iraq war, we're concerned about about adverse events to smallpox vaccine, which had been given to some first uh, first responders. Uh, and so there was a question here of risk analysis and of risk perception, risk communication. Uh, I went to a, this to, uh, to a meeting on this and met a high school friend named uh, Larry Brilliant, who's uh, some of you may uh, some of you may know is a well-known epidemiologist. We spent a long time during personal personal geography discovered we had spent two years together in high school German class at um, Detroit Mumford High and had absolutely no memory of one, one another. Uh, and, but we stayed in touch af afterwards. Uh, a few years later, so we had SARS in that period. A few years later, there was a pending pandemic of uh, H5N1, of avian flu. Larry anticipated, I think appropriately, that we would respond poorly. And he, with his convening authority, he brought together a group called Pan Defense 1.0, which about 20 leading world public health officials and 20 leading people in the, in the kind of technologies that would keep, might keep us going during a pandemic, like they're keeping us going to some extent uh, now. It, uh, this meeting had, uh, which is really a remarkable meeting, it had two thrusts, it, uh, intellectual thrusts. One was a scenario planning exercise led by uh, Peter Schwartz of Global Business Network that, that uh, Bob Horn, who's a political scientist at Stanford, produced a, uh, a graphic description of how this pandemic might un un unfold. And then a second thrust that Wendy and I and uh, Larry and our colleague Denise Caruso did, which was to ask people before the meeting what they considered to be the risks of, of this. So this is one of the figures from that, that paper. We asked people how likely it was that the risk would be that the, that the disease would become transmissible. And we compared the distribution of probabilities given by the public health experts and these other uh, equally accomplished people who did not know public, uh, uh, pub public health. So after the meeting, we said, well, how do we bring these two perspectives together, the descriptive and the, and, and the analytic, and together along with Umid Guvench, a, a, um, a graduate student at, at, that, at that time, we put together a plan of saying, well, how could you create what we called qualitative formal models with the form of an influence diagram of the sort that you could use to predict how the degree, how a pandemic would unfold, taking advantage of hard evidence where you had it and, and uh, expert judgment where you didn't. So we did it for pharmacological interventions and we just created this kind of expert model also for behavioral interventions. Um, which are often largely neglected and underanalyzed in these situations, and comparing the two pictures, much more complicated. Um, we did some work together with, with this was a part of uh, Umit's uh, d dissertation, trying to see whether you could communicate better with scenarios or, or with uh, or with, with models and found some of to our surprise that, the, that showing people the models communicated better than showing them, uh, showing them scenarios and putting them together, actually slightly degraded performance with the, uh, with the, with the models. 
uh, uh, 10 years later, we were, I, uh, I was part of a project where we had an access to a national sample of people, uh, a nationally representative sample asking what they understood about, uh, 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 about Ebola. We asked them as is our way, uh, quantitative questions, precise questions eliciting quantitative answers. One of those involved, I think, the first study in which, which uh, a sample of lay people had been asked to, to estimate R naught or the basic reproductive uh, fa function, uh, <clears throat> a number in, in, which we phrase as if somebody gets Ebola in the US, how many people do you think will catch it from them directly on, on average? Uh, this is the probability distribution. This is the uh, histogram of the judgments that they that they gave us, and they for an esoteric concept where people have never been asked this question before. You've got pretty good answers, median around two, at, not bad for this stage of the uh, of, of the pandemic. And then um, earlier this year, I heard from Larry again. Larry was had put together another pan defense, pan defense organization that was looking to help organ and Larry had spent the ensuing 15 year period trying to do something to prevent pandemics. Uh, and um, really, if Larry couldn't do it, maybe nobody, nobody, uh, nobody, nobody could. But it went through some of his contacts. We had a project where we consulted with the uh, the movie industry on how you might take advantage of our science in order to reopen sets. So here's this report that's joined to these four consortia of uh, of, of unions. We worked with the directors Guild of Guild of America and these other four, the Teamsters and the other two groups, had together came up with a uh, with a general general plan. It followed. I think one of the nicest. That was, a, I think, a textbook case of how one might do a good job of managing these kinds of uh, kinds of risks. So the governors of California and New York, two of the three large um, uh, largest uh, movie um, <coughs> uh, production states, George was apparently the third. They asked the industry to produce reopening plans for their approval. Uh, they said, "You have the expertise. It's our. We make the judgment." and you get your act together and give us a plan. So the unions organized into four groups. They consolidated their procedural guidelines. So they more or less agreed with what needs to be done on set. Like everybody has their own makeup, no open buffet. The unions then commissioned risk analysis of testing efficacy where their experts' intuitions differed. So the main disagreement between the, between the, the union uh, uh, consortia was whether testing was needed every day or not at all or, or any, any week. And, they, and, and a quantitative analysis done by Jeff Shaman at, uh, uh, at Columbia, in effect, carried the day. And they produced a consensus report that serves as a basis for negotiation with the states and the uh, and and the studios. About the same time, I was asked to join the Academy's COVID nineteen committee, led by uh, ha Harvey Feinberg, who uh, went to the same high school as my kids, Taylor uh, Alderdice in uh, in Pittsburgh. Really, a terrific uh, committee. It did a bunch of rapid response reports in. March and early April. I worked on two, one on crisis standards of care. That is what happens when you can't provide, we resource constrained, we can't provide people the usual standards of care. And the second on homemade fabric face masks. These are consensus reports done in 10 days rather than the year and a half that's typical of the academy. Uh, they were reported to the Office of Science and Technology Policy and to the Department of Health and Human Services. You might in, in retrospect, look at the at the report on uh, how well homemade fabric face masks would protect other uh, protect other people as opposed to protecting the wearer. This has not been it had not been probably still is not a, an area where there's been great investment. Our conclusion was that there was limited F, F evidence on 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 effectiveness. I reread this every few weeks, wondering whether we communicated this kind of uncertainty as well as we might have. We also made a strong plea not to speculate about behavior, noting that there were co contradictory speculations with no evidence. Some people saying, well, people use masks, they won't do anything else. Other people saying people use masks, then they'll identify themselves as uh, this would become part of their behavioral, uh, behavioral norm. And then last, I'd like to talk a little bit about the Committee on Equitable Vaccine. This was a uh, uh, committee 
uh, commissioned by the heads of CDC and NIH, who said in their public statements, they needed an independent opinion because the public doesn't entirely trust the federal government. We had another outstanding committee led by Helene Gale and Bill Fagey, former head of, uh, of, of CDC. It was a hardworking committee, a good spirited committee. We even had a party after the a Zoom party after the committee was, uh, committee was over. We made these commitments that to ensure that the, that the framework is equitable and seen as equitable. We designed it to be equally, easily and equally understood by diverse audiences to reflect widely accepted social and ethical principles, be reliably transmitted into operational terms, distinguish scientific and ethical judgments in its application, and not perpetuate discrimination and, and, uh, and, and, and inequities. And uh, I'll let you be the judge, but I think that we, through our collective effort, did a pretty good job on these things. We had, uh, these are our chapters. We had a discussion draft that went out. Uh, for three and a half days, we got a 1,400 comments, all of which were, which were responded to. We had a public hearing where our staff managed to, bring, to provide access to people who often do not sit at the table of these things. If you look at, the, uh, the, of, uh, at their institutional affiliations, we created a framework that had goals, allocation criteria, and then finally came up with a proposed proposals for what should be the priorities in distributing the vaccine. Here's our overall goal. This goal was met, was, sent as a, was designed as a reflection of principles that the bioethicists on the community uh, uh, on the committee came up with, both ethical and procedural goals. And they were the goals were translated into action with these risk-based uh, cri criteria of the sort that would be familiar to the risk audience, risk analysts, and decision analysts in the audience. So a group had higher priority to the extent that its members had these four risks. So this is a, this is a strategy for dealing with inequities. It's an indirect strategy for dealing with inequities. It takes inequities as indicators that people are likely to have compromised health because of how they have been treated. They are likely to have workplace exposures because of the kinds of jobs that they do, and then they're likely to be in living conditions conducive to to transmission. We did not say we were trying to. Uh, undo, we're trying to, uh, historic inequities, but we're trying to avoid perpetuating them. And the rest of the committee, the report deals in detail with how it is that, what are the structural barriers that prevent us from realizing these goals, even if these, print, this, these phases were adopted. So here are the phases, uh, they've been widely publicized and we could talk about them if, you, if you'd like. The committee with a, with a decision analysis mindset recognized that we were doing this in September, August and September for vaccines that will perhaps not be approved at all for a couple of months, not be widely available for six to eight months. So there's a lot of uncertainty. So the committee worked through how this would be, uh, how this would be, uh, what the uncertainties were and how they would affect the priorities, often not very much. We hear our recommendations. I'll, I'll leave the slides there so people can read them. I will draw attention to the fact that we had uh, we had rec separate recommendations for risk communication and health promotion. Uh, the recommendations for risk communication were how is it that we get the facts out to people so they can render a fair, independent judgment of the vaccine and the vaccine program in ways that will integrate with this entire entire program. We distinguish that as separate from health promotion, which is the job of overcoming vaccine he hesitancy, countering the arguments of unsupported, uh, uh, un unsupported skeptics. We made the point that you need them both. People need the facts and they need to know what the recommendations are from the public health community. We talked about some specific issues in, deal in executing the, the um, risk communication, we made a distinction between risk communication and health promotion, which turned out to be somewhat foreign to people who are, who are accustomed to doing uh, um, uh, health, uh, health promotion, just as trying to can get people to do things is somewhat foreign to the people who just want to get the message out. Will this make a difference? 
I don't really know. There is no coordinated communication program uh, program uh, now. Uh, the vacuum is being filled by by other people, um, um, voices with various intents. Uh, four years ago at this time, I was part of a planning committee for the Institute of Medicine that put together a workshop on building communication capacity to counter infectious disease threats. Um, that was four years ago and nothing happened. Um, maybe something will happen now, uh, given that the pandemics is, uh, pandemic is here and not just a theoretical uh, uh, possibility. So thank you. Yes, thank you for your presentation. Um, I uh, would like to ask you a couple of questions before we open up the Q&A. Um, and uh, one thing that I wanted to ask about is um, the inconclusive evidence about homemade face masks. So I think both you and I served on expert panels in 2006, where the conclusion was that there wasn't enough evidence and uh, basically nothing happened uh, until now. Um, but the National Academy of Sciences has put together a committee on um, uh, that will design a study to uh, find out uh, whether homemade masks work. And, uh, and I'm on that committee. And so I wanted to ask you, what advice do you have for me and the other members of the committee? Uh, what, uh, how should we design a study to examine the effectiveness of homemade masks? So I saw you showed me the the uh, the, the committee is really a terrific committee, including some overlap with uh, with 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 our, our, our committee. So, you know, the, the the deep issue here is that the behavioral science issues have not been dealt with. You know, so what are our national priorities that have spent lots of money on technology, lots of money on pharmaceuticals, and essentially nothing on these practical matters of that are critical to people's people's lives? We also have done very little to communicate the the risks and the effectiveness of the. We haven't even estimated them. So we have our current strategy is one of a. The, a kind of defense in depth that if I wear a mask, it protects me and it protects it protects you. If I keep my distance, it does things. If people, uh, you know, if uh, dining establishments maintain safety, if everybody is good, all of these things add up in in in, in some way. It and and nobody has run the numbers for people on on how much of a difference. Uh, 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 does does it make in the model that Jeff Shaman did for reopening the studios? It turned out that there was an unintuitive sweet spot that if you test every week with good tests and test fairly more regularly with weak tests, you get a lot of protection. How much protection you get is highly sensitive to the amount of disease that's in the community and how well it's trans it's being transmitted. So if the public health officials with cooperative population and coordinated government action have been, um, you know, have been gotten the disease down and people are all helping one, one another, then that's part of the picture. So I would say put that you need to do that analysis to put the results on face masks in, in a context to see it may well be. I mean, this was our sense back in back in 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 April that we didn't know that much. We knew that I mean, you can imagine homemade fabric face masks have not been. Uh, they're not all. There aren't aren't going to be unicorns in in developing and marketing homemade fabric uh, fabric face face masks, um, but. The limit evidence that we had was probably all you needed to know in order to say that these were these were an effective contributor to um, to defense in depth. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one thing I also wonder is um, uh, technically a mask may one type of mask may be more effective than another, but if they're uncomfortable to wear and people don't want to wear them, then in reality uh, people maybe end end up wearing them on their elbows, and that's not. Yeah. Uh, where masks are effective. So perhaps a, a mask that is technically less effective might actually in reality be more effective because people actually will wear them. Yeah, so there's a vast, as you know, there's a vast literature on, not only on protective behavior, but on protective, on protective clothing. Uh, David Michaels, who's on your, on your committee, was the head of OSHA 
he, he's the sort of person that no, but people just improvise stuff that has to do with be, has to do with behavior where they wouldn't envision doing that with pharmaceuticals or technology. Right. Yeah. Um, here's another question that I would like to ask you. Um, so you have contributed your expertise on behavioral decision making to a large number of projects and topics, including not just COVID-19, but also climate change and homeland security. Um, what advice do you have for behavioral scientists and psychologists who would also like to contribute their expertise to policy and imp on important societal topics? Uh, I, I, one thing that may be unintuitive and, and it's kind of difficult is that you need to hang out. It's important to hang out with the people who own these problems. That is, you know, these are groups of scientists, these are regulators, these are local, local officials, you need to spend the time with them to understand the problems, their constraints, their language. And, uh, and so they have some reason to trust you when you purport to offer them advice. So that's one, one thing in most academic departments, you're not rewarded for hanging out. And second thing is, if you're off, I mean, if you're interested in doing this, you're often the only person, only person representing the psychology, the social science, you might be the only person representing the sciences there. And it's appropriate to be a representative of all of that, and not your pet theory and use this as a this, this application where other people's lives and livelihood depend on it as an opportunity to test one of your, uh, test one of your, your theories. So it's incumbent upon our um, academic departments to provide incentives for people to spend that time and to be you know, a representative of the field and not just do things that will uh, you know, fatten their uh, CV. Right, thank you. Um, and so another thing I'd like to ask is you've been central to the development of the field of the behavioral decision making. You were a PhD student of Amos Tversky in Jerusalem, and then you wrote your dissertation on hindsight, which came out in 1975, I believe, and has been cited more than 3000 times since then. What was that like to be part of this new exciting development? Well, I, I can't say that I knew that it would be a citation hit because I didn't know what a citation was at the time. So um, it was really, it was, it was totally fantastic. I mean, I was just extraordinarily fortunate. I was just, I thought of myself as kind of a hick from Detroit. Somebody told me I, I was dropped out of school for a while. Somebody said, if I went back, oh, actually I think Clyde Coombs told me if I went back, I should look up Amos Tversky. I had his name. He took me as a student and he and he and Donnie are two of the, you know, brightest, you know, smartest, uh, inquisitive people ever. And they, there was this tremendous um, group of doctoral students who took us in. Andy, my wife and I were immigrants, were somewhat coddled in immigrants in Israel, but immigrants nonetheless. And we were sort of adopted in this group that participated in, in what turned out to be, uh, to about be this, this field. And, and, and we were, encouraged to find our own work, that it was, that the, the it, there was not a Tversky Kahneman lab. It, they did not assign us projects on their behalf, but to find something that they were capable of, uh, of, of advising. And then they supported us in finding our, our you know, fi in finding our own way. And so I, uh, it's more, you know, nerve wracking, anxiety provoking that if you're given a, a piece of a large puzzle to, to fill out, but was really, uh, I was really very fortunate. And then Paul Slovic joined them the, the last year of my graduate school. And then he and Sarah Lichtenstein took me in for a postdoc. So I was just extremely fortunate and in some ways fortunate to be in a field that didn't really exist. So you had the problems of there being no real journals and having to convince it. On the other hand, if you could make your case, um, you know, you, you could, uh, and it was really an unusual opportunity. I feel extraordinarily fortunate. Yes, it sounds like a really exciting time. And basically the meetings of the field would include maybe 30 people at the time. Is that right? 
Yeah, so the late Ward Edwards used to have the Bayesian meeting. I think they're in their 50th, 50 something year now. Mike Birnbaum, I think, hosts it now. And all sorts of people came together. And it was so small that people who, you know, before the, the field like speciated, it was so small that you brought together. So I remember a meeting at, uh, I forget the name of the hotel and uh, that, that where Ward, Ward hosted it. You know where you had, uh, you know, had Ron Howard from Decision Analysis, Ralph Keeney might have been there, Paul Sarah and I, uh, I think Richard John might have been there. So you had people who came together, you know, who uh, were willing to take this gamble. I'll give ourselves the credit for that. <laughs> we didn't know any any better, but it was, uh, but that was, you know, something that's harder to do when you have a have a mature uh, field. Right. So how do you feel about how the field has developed since then? And what developments are you most excited about? Um, well, I think that I mean, it's obviously exciting. There were at, at one point, Sarah Lichtenstein maintained what she called called the list, which was everybody anywhere who was somehow involved with the field. It included people behind the Iron Curtain who were in trouble because they used terms like subjective probability or utility, making them into Benthamites. You know, and now there are you know, multiple groups with hundreds or thousands of people who were doing it. I think it, the field has become, you know, in some ways, thanks to the people like Donnie who, could, who were able to write nonfiction be, uh, be, bestsellers has become, you know, part of the, part of the culture. I think the big challenge that, 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 that we face is to find ways to do collaborative work with people in other disciplines in working very complicated problems. That sort of collaborative work does not come naturally to academic uh, the, the social science, uh, behavioral and social science uh, departments. It's really much more natural and where I do most of my work or where we did our work together you know, in the Department of Engineering and Public Policy where engineers are accustomed to assembling, uh, assembling teams of people who each have some narrow expertise are willing to represent their entire field and want to get the problem right uh, and then are confident that they, or at least hope, that they can extract some basic research from these novel inter interactions, which was you know, where we were 40, 50 years ago. Yeah, even I have seen that change happening. I got my, as you know, my PhD with you in 98. And um, uh, at the time, it was difficult to explain what behavioral decision-making was. People didn't know, employers didn't know. Uh, and now, uh, because of uh, Danny Kahneman's Nobel Prize, uh, in part, and all the uh, uh, activities that, that uh, uh, people in the field have uh, participated in over the, over the years, there's now a, a real appetite for policymakers to apply behavioral decision making and behavioral economics to policy uh, to make a difference. So hopefully, uh, we can step up and do that. Um, let's um, open it up for questions. Harley, are there any questions? Hi, yes, there are a few. So the first question is, how much attention was placed in your committee's studies on how to balance between lowering first order health risks from the, from the focus risk COVID now and not adversely affecting economic well-being or other health risks? Okay. Yeah, so there was a, a lot of discussion of, of that, and the, the uh, risk criteria were, uh, just to repeat it, so I don't have the slide up here, so uh, what's the probability of people getting sick, what's the probability of people uh, becoming severely ill if they catch the disease, what will be the loss to society if they are no longer able to function, and what's the probability that they will transmit the disease to others, which is somewhat correlated with the probability of, of catching the disease, but you can imagine you know, cases where it's, it's, it's independent, and the priorities reflect uh, in the four phases. The first is a, is a, we call it a jumpstart stage, where we first give give the where the first we recommend that the first vaccine go to uh, to frontline personnel uh, in in uh, medical medical settings 
and to first, res first responders. And because those met all of those criteria, you know, we're all in big trouble if those people can't do their, uh, can't do their job. And we made it clear that everybody in those systems is part of the solution and get that priority. So the hospitals need the cleaners, they need the greeters, as well as they need the attendings to, uh, you know, to, to help people. Um, and uh, so we try to balance them, balance, you know, to get to address them, uh, address them both. One of the things that we that we wrestled with, well, how do you determine somebody's value to value to society? And the way we ended up defining it was this is how many people are directly dependent on somebody. So that that would be it was not, not how much they made, you know, uh, how important they felt, you know, where they were in the organizational chart. But if somebody became ill and if a teacher became ill and you had to close, close a classroom, that was, that, that was, that was prob problematic. Or if a first responder, somebody with unique skill was unable, was unable to work, then, uh, then, they, then they got a high priority in terms of, uh, of um, keeping society running. Um, somebody wanted me to let you know that you had said you forgot the name of the place that Ward Edwards held the research conference. And it was at the Sportsman's Lodge in the Valley. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> Is it still there? I am not sure, but we, I'm happy to look it up for you. And just so that our viewers know, we will post all of Baruch's slides onto our website along with the video from today. But another question for you. In regard to behavioral science and design and testing, what is organized medicine, psychiatry, behavioral health and policy and elected officials to do to take necessary action to achieve the change? So, so I think that one of the, play, the, the discipline of communication is, is the behavioral, to my mind, is the behavioral decision research discipline. Find out what problems people are solving. Find out what they know already. Get them the information that they need to know. Make certain that it that it works. And this is an iterative process that requires first analysis, getting the information together, and then uh, descriptive research, finding out where people are, and then empirically testing your messages. I think those steps are very rarely practiced. Uh, in all of those professions that you're that you're that you're that you're talking about, the typical. Uh, management of a communication process is somebody decides what the audience needs to know, uh, writes it down, gives it to, if they have the budget, gives it somebody who can give it good production values. And then if it doesn't work, uh, they blame the, uh, they blame the audience. Um, this is in, in the vaccine case, I think we, we face a significant threat that we will not have the evidence that we need in order to communicate about the safety and effectiveness of the of the vaccine and uh, how well it's being being distributed. It's not clear that the sort of national databases will be created and made available in in a um, in a in a trustworthy, authoritative, accessible way. If that is the case, then we will face an empirical challenge of listening to people to find out what's really important to them and then testing our messages. In the report, we emphasize the critical role of the local uh, partners who have the trust of the community and, have, and, and can listen to the communities and communicate what's going on to the, to the, program, uh, the program leadership. We also emphasize the, the that great margin utility of the simplest testing. You've got a message have some people people do a think aloud protocol telling you what they think you're think you're saying and then amend as necessary. There is uh, one of the dodges of people who do who fail their commute their responsibility for for communication. One of them is that oh it's too expensive so that doesn't cost anything to to do that. And the second is we don't have any, we don't have time so it's bad management if you don't have time to do an essential part of your part of your job but you always have time to run your message by somebody consider particularly in a situation where there's uh, where there's health 
reputational, economic, and political stakes riding on having effective communications. One of the things that we said is that it is important that the, that the communication work be done with, with firms and institutions that have trusted relations with the local, local communities. So this is not a case where you can do a big IBAD, a big ad buy with a national firm that can claim to reach diverse audiences. You really need people with those, uh, with, with those, those, with those skills. Thank you. Um, so another question is somebody that works in healthcare hospitals for many years said that they're noticing fewer people are coming in for care. And when they do their acuity is much higher. Can we apply a similar model to determine if this behavior is solely motivated by the pandemic or are there other variables in play? What model can we apply to better understand patient and consumer behavioral insights? So I would defer to people who study that kind of behavior rather than speculate, but the same principle on the communication, the two-way communication part, the same principles apply. You need trusted people who will listen to patients who are coming in, patients who are not coming in, people in the community who have their ear in order to find out what's going on, uh, find the, the information that they're, that, that they're missing, and then find and test ways to get the information out to them through trusted, uh, through trusted channels. That's fulfilling the duty to inform. There are other duties. There is a health promotion duty to tell people, well, what does the doctor say? What does the public health community say? But that's a separate, uh, uh, a separate duty. Chapter five in our report talks about the barriers to access that are often associated with, uh, with health inequities. Uh, can people get to the clinic? Uh, will they have to pay? Uh, will the, if we recommend that nobody have to pay, but then you still have to provide money to the organizations that, uh, <clears throat> that, will, pro that will provide the vaccine. Sometimes those are organizations, the most trusted organizations with the best outreach are organizations that correlated with health inequities, do not have the political clout to get the resources that they need in order to serve their, uh, to serve their population. But that, that's really other people's ec expertise. Mine is the, my, my niche is the two-way communication and risk analysis. Okay, this next question is actually from somebody on our Facebook live stream. Thank you for sending it in. How can it be possible to nudge reluctant people to better habits concerning health protocols needed to fight coronavirus? Um, I would defer people to people who do nudges. There is the there are these two distinct uh, branches. There's the risk communication, get the facts, trust people to make uh, independent decisions. If you've done your you know if you've done everything possible to empower them, recognize where every where things where where things have failed. And then there are people who can pick up when you've done everything possible to empower people in order to. Um, get them to do things that are determined to be be of their own good, and they of course that community of course has its own standards for when it is ethical to manipulate people for their for their own good. What are the procedures of inclusion? What are the kind of checks and balances that you need? But but that's I don't really know that literature, and I think it's important to have to distinguish between the two. And this next question kind of touched on it a little bit, but what combination of behavioral policy and communication measures might get this disease under control? <laughs> well, you know, it's a, it's a, I would like to see somebody do some behaviorally informed modeling about how all of these various imperfect measures fit uh, fit 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 together. If I the the model that Wendy, Denise, uh, Larry, and I put together fifteen years ago conceptually has the pieces that you that that you would need in order to to do that. We tried to define the variables in our model precisely enough that you could either find empirical evidence or elicit expert judgment that would enable you to run 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 the model. I think. I, these these are dynamic, complicated models. We should not trust our in, intuitions. Uh, Jeff Shaman's model of the relatively simple environment of uh, of a movie set had six variables and produced some surprising surprising uh, results. I think we 
owe it owe it to the public, uh, owe it to the public treasury that might be funding some of this to educate our intuitions with a little behaviorally informed uh, modeling. And I think we have time for one, maybe two more questions. So the next one is, where do you see the future of science slash industry collaborations in this area, particularly the growing mistrust worldwide in politicians? <laughs> oh, uh... I don't know if you want a crystal ball. Is it as for, is that as for a crystal ball or a magic wand? Uh, you know, I think you know, th th just to repeat something that I said, uh, that, that I, or to paraphrase something that I said earlier. You know, our universities are an enormous reservoir of, of of expertise. I see an awful lot of, particularly among younger scientists who are eager to do collaborative work to make a difference in in, in the world. Who you know who chafe against the the requirement to to do to create uh, traditional uh, uh, resumes with a lot of studies on relatively narrow areas. So I think we need to create um, places where people can learn to to do to work collaboratively and identify the new issues that can gener that can provide intellectual capital to our our ba ba basic basic research. It's not clear to me that our federal funding agencies are up to that that task. If you look at the work that comes out of uh, multidisciplinary calls from various agencies, it could be that industry, which is a which is problem focused, could make investments with proper safeguards of you know of, of various sorts that would enable the universities to unleash this uh, this I think unfulfilled potential for, for collaborative uh, work that bridges basic and, and the basic research and applications. Thank you so much. Wendy, do you have any last question? Um, I, I saw a question in the Q&A that I think would be interesting to ask. Uh, can you comment on the implications of overconfidence in hindsight with regard to the pandemic? <laughs> um, well, the it, <laughs> overcoming hindsight bias, you do have to do what there's, there's two things I would say. One is do what historians do: look at the record, who said what, when, what were the documents that they had before them, so that people can't re-rate re the history. And second, when people say there's a kind of hindsight bias, bias where people people uh, try to protect their own malfeasance or incompetence by saying nobody could know. If this is a matter of basic intelligence, which certainly pandemics are, if you didn't know, you haven't done your job. Thank you. Thank you both so much for joining us today. And thank you to our viewers. We really appreciate it. And we hope to see you at a future live virtual event. Have a great rest of the day. Thank you for having me. Bye-bye.